With the stock market crash of 1929 and the arrival of the Great Depression, the United States found itself in an era of turmoil and uncertainty. Franklin D. Roosevelt was elected president on a platform of reform that would also benefit federal Indian policy. Roosevelt's Commissioner of Indian Affairs, John Collier, helped craft the Indian Reorganization Act in 1934, intended to stop Native land loss and restore self-governance by Native Americans. This act, along with reforms triggered by the Merriam Report, would play out at Shalaka with varying degrees of success over the next 30 years. When I think of Shalako, I think of Ellie Carell. Lawrence E. Carell became the superintendent of Shalako in 1926. Carell was an educated man with a background in agriculture, respected by students and staff. And I think he was sincere in, in building character and excellence in those students. And um, I don't think I would be able to say all the positive things that I, that I always say about Shalako had he not been our superintendent. During the Corel era, day-to-day -day life for students at Shalako changed dramatically. The militaristic nature of the school's instruction, along with harsh disciplinary practices of old, gave way to a more humanistic approach. Consideration for student welfare became more pronounced. Under Carell, educational offerings were expanded to include four years of high school. Programs to teach Native history and lore were implemented, a departure from the school's earlier avoidance of Native subject matter. Despite these advances, the quality of education at Shalako continued to trail public schools. Courses were often rudimentary to accommodate those who were non-English speakers. Many classes were segregated by gender. I wish that they had a better educational system. When I went to Shalako, there was no homework. I was in the old age whenever they were still separating boys and girls subjects. The girls couldn't take math because that was a boys class and we got the credentials of being educated <laughs> even if we didn't get the education. <laughs> the Merriam Report had called for classes that served the individual abilities, interests, and needs of the students. But in Native American boarding schools, this was largely interpreted to mean vocational training. This vocational focus suited L.E. Correll, who turned Shalako into a premier agricultural school. I was not an agriculture student, but the Shalako grads who majored in agriculture were probably 50% ahead of any farmer you want to pick out there who's farming right now. They, they knew more. They could probably made more money on their farm than their neighbors. Correll instituted courses in horticulture, crop treatment, soil management, and animal husbandry. His soil and erosion control program was adopted by Oklahoma A&M. Correll also started a plot program, which allowed students to learn and earn at the same time, raising their own individual crops on school land and selling them for a profit. Animal husbandry was another important agricultural program. Under Correll, the school acquired a herd of Morgan horses, and soon its breeding program became the largest in the world. Shalako also raised record-making herds of dairy that improved livestock herds throughout Oklahoma and southern Kansas. Numerous outside schools sent representatives to Shalako to learn about their stock raising. These and other vocational programs helped many Shalakoans have successful careers after they left the school. One of the trades I thought was very uh, progressive was printing. They had a uh, linotype operator. Of course, that's old stuff, but you had to have that if you were going to have a print shop. And there were a lot of guys 
who uh, took printing. You print, we, they printed our papers, the little Sulaco journals that we had. There was another guy who took baking. He was from North Carolina. When he went back to North Carolina, he bought a donut shop, a, little, a small donut shop that he was working in, and he became the founder of Krispy Kreme Donuts. After World War I, Shalako's enrollment continued to climb. Additional employees were hired, and new buildings were added. These included a women's gymnasium, which later housed the Navajo program, an accelerated track to help Navajo students with little or no schooling become fluent in English. These students would graduate from the eighth grade within three years. In addition to four hours of classwork and four hours of vocational training, students contributed to the daily running of the school through their work details. They handled the food preparation and laundry services, the feeding and grooming of livestock, and the repairs of machinery. First of all, I was impressed with the uh, greenery uh, and, and the uh, immaculate groundskeeping that somebody did. There was a, uh, an oval in, at the center, center of the campus around which all the buildings were built. And there was a water fountain with a fish pond uh, in the center of it. They kept the grounds up very well. We couldn't walk on the grass. If we did, we would be restricted. And in the spring, we had lilacs blooming, baby's breath, uh, or wedding veil, roses, and it was just beautiful. But the most iconic site was always the Poplar Line Shalako Drive with its imposing iron entryway. The arch. Uh, this is a landmark that is forever burned into my heart is that arch. Despite the constant chores, or perhaps because of them, students treasured the rare spare time they had. Whenever they could escape outside, they would make small fires and parch corn, maybe organize a stomp dance or drum practice, or simply play games. From the 30s onward, boys and girls were allowed to eat together at lunch and mingle more freely. The one thing that I remember is that we had fun. I've heard stories about uh, Indian schools quite to the contrary. And it must have been miserable for some of those early students. It was like heaven to us. For entertainment, students could attend movies at Hayward Hall though they had to pass through a line of matrons to do so and sit with the matrons nearby in the movie. Saturday night dances were another memorable activity, and many a Shalako marriage was ignited on the dance floor. We had to dress up to go to the dances. The students learned to waltz and foxtrot, and then when rock and roll came, all of those. Shalako's athletic program expanded during this era because Ellie Correll felt that athletics were important for building character. Shalako boxers were among the best in the nation, earning the school national and international attention. The team made several appearances at the Chicago's World Fair and won several Golden Glove matches in the 1930s. We always had a champ who represented Oklahoma by going to the national Golden Gloves. To be a national champ, you had to win the state. And then you went to Chicago, where the West, they called Chicago the West, uh, fought the East. That was New York City. And uh, most of the time, the West won the tournament, the national tournament. I guess because we had so many Indian schools that had boxers. Shalako students competed in football, baseball, and many other sports. There was a pep squad and marching band that accompanied teams to games. We um, had a pretty large band. We had a drum major and had twirlers, nice uniforms, 
I think we marched at Guthrie and Tulsa and at the Arkalala in Arkansas City. Maintaining such a large campus required high enrollment at the school, so a recruitment program was launched to bring in students to Shilako from other parts of the country. By the 1930s and 40s, Shilako's student body was made up of many tribes, coming from as far away as Alaska. Despite this intertribal mixing, cliques still played a big role on the campus. Conflicts notwithstanding, the shared experience of Shilako bridged many tribal rivalries and helped bring students closer together. Shilako had high standards and they taught you those standards. And they had all the different tribes to come together and live together and get along and learn about each other and make friends with each other. Many of the intertribal bonds and friendships formed at Chilaco and other Indian schools would ultimately lay the groundwork for the Native activist movements to come in the 1960s and 70s. Chilaco was unique among Indian schools in having its own National Guard Center. Company C was established in 1925 with 75 students and one non-Indian officer. The ability to earn extra money with the Guard while still attending school was a strong incentive to joining. When you went to a drill, you were given credit for some money. When you went to um, Fort Sill, you were paid active duty rate for your grade for two weeks. That's income you would not have otherwise. Company C of Shilako began active duty in World War II on September 16, 1940, when Oklahoma's 45th Division was mobilized. They saw action in North Africa, Sicily, and Italy. 35 students lost their lives, including Henry Nolatubby, the first American Indian killed in the war. Ironically, according to many Shilako veterans, the hardship and discipline of boarding school helped them adjust to the military better than their public school counterparts. Shilako produced two Medal of Honor winners during World War II, Lieutenant Ernest Childers, Muskogee Creek, and Lieutenant Jack Montgomery, Cherokee. The women also did their part. They wrote letters to their classmates turned soldiers and marched in the 3rd Liberty Loan Drive in Arkansas City, Kansas to promote war bonds. Because Shilako offered clerical classes, its female students were prepared to answer the government's call for support staff during the war. Civilian students at Shilako also contributed to the war effort. Some took classes in sheet metal welding and riveting school to furnish the Army with needed supplies. Upon graduation, these students possessed a set of valuable skills that could be used by the defense industry. Students also collected scrap metal and worked longer hours in the school's fields and gardens to raise additional food for the soldiers. During the Korean War, Shilagawan served in the 279th Infantry of the 45th Thunderbird Division. They chose as their mascot the infamous Charlie Doll, a well-known caricature of the so-called Savage Indian, and placed it on their guide-on. The men were known as the Charlie Company because of the doll. This stereotypical image of Indianness became a symbol of resistance, a proclamation of real Indians ready for the fight. In 1966, the Shilako unit was discontinued and moved off campus. It is now located in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. We can point to almost 70% of our male students, our veterans, uh, having joined the armed forces at one point uh, in their life. And then when you look at this figure and then you see the number of females who have joined the military, then Shilako made a vast contribution Throughout the 60s, Shilako would continue evolving and making reforms. However, following the 1969 Kennedy Report, which called out ongoing failures of federal Indian education, the school, which had been celebrated for many of its achievements, would experience a change of fortune. 